You know, I have to commend you all for coming out. First of all, this seems like an incre incredibly and impressively boring subject. Uh, and it's in the regulatory weeds. And it's also very important because the social cost of carbon is used to justify regulation uh, on the putative basis that, are you going to go to the slide? There we go. On the putative basis that uh, we are actually saving you all tremendous amounts of money by putting in these minuscule emissions restrictions uh, that are justified by this thing. I, I run something called the Center for the Study of Science at the Cato Institute. It's been around for about a year. Uh, we are interested in exactly this particular type of problem, which is how we get such horrific regulation uh, justified by, quote, science, end quote. Uh, and it results from the incentive structure for science and all kinds of uh, perverse things that happen when science becomes a public good with monopoly funding from one provider. That would be the people in this building. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the kind of people that we're bringing on, uh, in the last six months we brought on Richard Lindzen from MIT, uh, Ed Calabrese, who is very, very important in the regulatory world from University of Massachusetts, and now Terence Keeley, author of the Bible on the economic loss of scientific research. Okay, let's go to the next image. On the social cost of carbon. <coughs> uh, I submitted comments along with Paul Knappenberger, uh, who works with me at Cato. Uh, and uh, this is sort of the, uh, the key finding, the determination of the social cost of carbon is discordant with the best scientific literature on equilibrium climate sensitivity. In other words, it's way behind the times. And it knows it, but it simply decides to, decided to go forward. And the fertilization effect of carbon dioxide, you put CO, you know, you know, in high school, CO2 plus H2O yields CH2O. That's the simple equation of photosynthesis. You increase the reactants on one side, you get more out on the other side. Shocking. Turns out you get a lot more out than you might have thought. And that simply was not factored in. Uh, and finally, uh, there are problems with uh, the so-called integrated assessment models that were used to determine the social cost of carbon. We'll talk about those briefly for a couple of minutes, uh, and I think you might actually wind up agreeing with me. Our conclusion is that the OMB, Office of Management and Budget, this is what we were commenting on, uh, should not just revise the current determination of the social cost of carbon, but suspend its use in all federal rulemaking. It is better not to include any value for the SCC in cost-benefit analyses than to include a value which is knowingly improper, inaccurate, and misleading. Aside from that, we have no strong feelings on this subject. Uh, next image, if we could. Ah, this, this invisible image, I was kind of hoping we were going to have a bigger screen. Uh, so <clears throat> imagine you can actually see this. This is uh, what is at the guts of the climate component of the social cost of carbon. It's something called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. That's how much warming you expect to get for <coughs> doubling atmospheric carbon dioxide, an arbitrary doubling. Uh, and here is a, a series of papers that I would call uh, paradigm-defining papers from about five to ten years ago. Uh, and <coughs> just to make sure that they were behind the times, the integrated assessment uh, methodology uh, uses a calibrated sensitivity by Rowe and Baker, which has about 2.5 degrees uh, uh, maximum frequency, but this huge fat tail on the right side. And the fat tail is the excuse, okay? The fat tail is, oh my God, it could be worse than we thought. Well, if you know anything about science, particularly environmental science, it's always worse than we thought, no matter whether it is or it's not. So the fat tail becomes the excuse for regulation. Too bad, <clears throat> this is so remarkably behind the times. Let's go to the next image if we could. Uh, since January 1st, 2011, a large number of papers have appeared in the refereed scientific literature. Okay, this is not, you know, Bozo's website or anything like that. The, these are 16 separate experiments, uh, and the equilibrium climate sensitivity in these is running somewhere uh, in the average value of about two, but note the 95% confidence limits for all these, and here is what's used for the social cost of carbon calculation. Uh, this is 
SCC calculation. This is the modern literature. I did not include in here the first of these sort of low sensitivity papers, which I published 10 years ago, and <clears throat> that caused all kinds of bad things in ClimateGate. Uh, like we want, don't want the editor to even have a job who allowed this paper to go in and such like that. A little sensitive field, okay? Don't know why. Anyway, uh, bottom line, uh, the calibrated Rowan Baker functional form, that's what's on the previous slide, used by the interagency working group is no longer scientifically defensible. That's a fact. And uh, one of these days, we're building a very, one of, one of the purposes of our many, many comments on the so social cost of carbon, microwave ovens, refrigerators, toasters, you name it, is to establish a very large record that we hope will ultimately enter in to the justification, if you will, or the justifying uh, of a lower sensitivity, lower social cost of carbon. Next image, if we could. Uh, the Rowan Baker di distribution has a median value of 3 degrees C, and the 5th and 95th percentiles are 1.72 to 7.14 degrees Celsius, doubling, uh, equilibrium warming for doubling. That's a huge number. And uh, seen as the equilibrium number for doubling is pretty close to the 2100 estimate given the, the, the rates of increase that we have in atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, you understand how fast the planet has to warm up. It's only got 86 years left to go up 7.1 degrees. It hasn't gone up any since late 1996, statistically speaking, so it better get cracking, which is one of the reasons that all these papers have appeared since the beginning of 1911. By the way, there are some scientists who are recognizing that this is falling apart. And they're, they're oftentimes adjusting their sensitivities based upon some principle that usually doesn't apply in global climate policy, which is called reality. Uh, the corresponding values averaged from the recent scientific literature are 2 degrees C, median, 1.1 degree in the 5th percentile, and 3.5 degrees on the 95th percentile. A huge difference, a different difference between something that is a justifiable regulatory problem and something that, well, maybe doing nothing is the best policy because we seem to become more efficient for market forces. That is what changes between those two figures. Next image. Here's the money show from the scientific problem. Now, this is a very small image. I want you to follow me because I want you to see what is really happening on the surface of the Earth compared to what was forecast to happen. Uh, there are 105 climate models that the United Nations used in its most re recent report that's been out for about eight months or so. Uh, they have been run many, many times so that you can generate statistical distributions of the ranges of warming or cooling. Sometimes these things actually predict uh, brief cooling trends. So you get the 90 and 95 percent confidence levels for the model projections. The average value of all the model projections is the solid line here for trend lengths of 10 years. That would mean from 2013 back to, uh, back to 2004, uh, and then 11 year would be 2013 back to 2003. We go all the way back to 1951. So uh, these are the, this is the average trend for uh, periods of from 10 to over 50 years in length predicted by the 105 models from the United Nations. We're, not, we're, not, we're using their stuff, okay? Because it turns out their stuff doesn't justify what's going on with the social cost of carbon. Uh, the dotted line is the 95th percentile, 95% uh, confidence uh, interval. Uh, the sort of uh, grayish one is the 90% or the 10% if you want to think about it. But of course, because we're really only interested in the one side, the cold side of this distribution, <clears throat> you might want to realize that we're actually going to 95 and 97.5 percent confidence uh, in terms of argument. And <clears throat> guess what? The red line is reality. Well, it's the, it's, the, it's the line that starts out green right here, which means that it's within the 90 percent confidence bounds for trends back to 1950, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when we get the trend back to about 35 years, all of a sudden it falls below the 90 percent, uh, again, this is single-sided, so it's actually better than that. Uh, that's the yellow color, and 
When it gets red, it's below the 95% confidence limit. Hey, you know what? When you test a hypo an hypothesis on data, and it, the null hypothesis unfortunately is entertained in the following sense, that the data shows that the hypothesis fails at the 0.05 level, the ethical thing to do, I, I chose that word right there, the ethical thing to do is to modify your hypothesis. And you sure as hell is not an ethical thing to use that hypothesis to justify costing the American people tons and tons of money. It doesn't work. Uh, by the way, this was presented to the American Geophysical Union uh, last summer, and the only negative comment was, you really shouldn't show this image because it might prevent regulation of carbon dioxide. No scientific claims, no scientific uh, griping, just you really shouldn't show this, okay? Uh, Emperor is kind of not wearing a lot of clothes. Next image. Uh, then there's carbon dioxide fertilization, completely ignored uh, by the integrated assessment models. Uh, it's, uh, uh, or it's either, uh, well, not completely, okay? It's largely ignored in, in the DICE model and the PAGE model. Uh, and it certainly <laughs> is underestimated. If you want to see how much carbon dioxide is accelerating uh, the growth of agricultural plants, we'll look at the next image, if we could. Uh, this is from Craig Idso very recently. Uh, it's from uh, a massive study of the literature. Uh, and these are the crops, C4 and C3 crops. Sugarcane, percent biomass change. This is just, just 300 parts per million increase of CO2. 34% corn uh, and maize, that would be 24%. These are all big, big numbers. And they're not really factored in to this discussion. Next image, we're almost done, don't worry. Uh, so, <coughs> IDSO uh, found that the increase in CO2 that took place from 61 to 2011 increased global agricultural output by about $3.2 trillion. Uh, in 2005 constant dollars. That's not a small sum. Uh, and if we project forward based upon uh, the UN scenarios that they use, the median emissions scenario, uh, CO2 fertilization would increase the value of agricultural output by $9.8 trillion during 2012 to, to 2050. This is a huge positive externality that is largely ignored in the calculation of the social cost of carbon lot of food for a lot of people. Next image. Uh, and then, <coughs> ha, this is my favorite, maybe. There's some, I mean, there are so many targets and so little time in this horrific uh, calculation that is being used to, ju to justify the taking of your money. Well, your money that you don't have anyway and you won't have, uh, but you get the idea. <coughs> um, the Interagency Working Group reports the global value. <coughs> That's the effect on all the countries of the world of the social cost of carbon. Uh, and uh, the domestic costs, if you leave out, if you don't do the global thing, they're about an order of magnitude lower than the global costs. Now, how much does this fly in the face of what they're supposed to do? Well, <clears throat> I know that we seem to be rewriting a certain somewhat unpopular law on the fly because it's unpopular. Just let's look at this stretch. You're, this is the OMB Circular A4 regarding regulatory analyses, okay? <clears throat> Your analysis should focus on benefits and costs that accrue to citizens and residents of the United States. Can we be more explicit? Okay, that's like, you know, individual mandate goes in place on January 1, 2013. It, it's a real statement. Where you choose to evaluate a regulation that is likely to have effects beyond the borders of the United States, these effects should be reported separately. The public, I will conclude, has no idea that the, pr the pr benefits of the proposed regulations on domestic activities uh, that supposedly accrue from incorporating the social cost of carbon are largely conferred upon the foreign nations. Let's hear it for transparency. Why wasn't this put out there? I don't know. Next image. Uh, this is the fine print, this is the, the uh, uh, discount rate that's assumed in the calculations of social cost of carbon. Now, I'm presuming, Dave Kreutzer is coming by, right? So I'm not gonna take, okay, cool. I'm gonna not gonna take a lot of time on this, but uh, OMB circular, circular A94 
states that, quote, a real discount rate of 7% should be used as a base case for regulatory analysis and to show the sensitivity of results, uh, quote, for regulatory analysis, you should provide estimates of the net benefit using both 3% and 7%. Okay, fine. So the higher the discount rate, the less the impact. In fact, if you get it to values that are pretty close to historical values, the impact, and you assume the right sensitivity for CO2, which is probably somewhere around 1.6 to 2 degrees C, something like that, you know what? The cost goes positive. That's right. In other words, you actually, it actually is a benefit, but you wouldn't want people to know that. So instead, the Interagency Working Group determined the social cost of carbon using discount rates of 2.5, 3, and 5 percent. Well, that's not exactly a rosy scenario. Maybe they're just taking into account the economic pillage that has been uh, visited upon coming decades. Who knows? Next image. Uh, finally, <coughs> MIT's Robert Pindick, 2013. Uh, I will take this sentence here. Uh, the, uh, what have the IAMs, the, the meaning the integrated assessment models, told us? The answer is very little. The models are so deeply flawed as to be close to useless as tools for policy analyses. Worse yet, precision that is simply illusory, uh, precision it can be highly misleading. An IAM-based analysis suggests a level of knowledge and precision that is non-existent, allowing the modeler to obtain almost any desired result because key inputs can be chosen arbitrarily. And that is exactly what happened here. There were marching orders. Make sure it costs a lot. So I can stand up in front of a camera and say, this is a great benefit to the American people. Put those numbers in, get it right. Well, it turns out, I think this is a blessing in disguise. Because there are so many problems with the sensitivity, so many problems with the discount rate. Uh, <coughs> and so many problems with, with the actual effects by using international versus national. You know what? One of these days, a judge is going to sit up and take notice. And I look forward to that day. Thanks. <laughs>